Hi everyone, um, thank you for joining us today. Um, apologies for kicking off slightly late. Um, we've had uh, a slight uh, issue with diaries and um, uh, Trudy Harrison, our, our new chair of the um, APPG, uh, is running a bit late. So um, I think we're going to get started without her um, and hopefully she'll be able to join us at some point. And in that case, she will take over from me um, and share this session um, and, and the Q&A with um, Sir Robert, who we're really pleased to have here today. Um, I'm sure Sir Robert doesn't need um, too much introduction, but um, he is Chair of the Environment, Food and Rural Affairs Committee in the House of Commons. Um, he's, as Chair of that committee, he's done work on so many topics that I know lots of you are all interested in. Um, he's led the committee since 2022. Um, and has had inquiries on things like land-based careers and education, soil health, food supply chains, um, and has obviously questioned uh, a succession of DEFRA ministers and secretaries of state um, in his time chairing that committee. Um, I'll hand over to um, Robert now, who can um, give a bit of an introduction to his work and what, what the committee are doing, uh, and then we'll be able to hand over to everyone else for questions that you might have. Um, so Robert, do you want to go ahead? Well, well, thank you very much indeed. I, mean, I think most people don't probably know who I am. I mean, I suppose I come to this having spent five years between 1999 and 2004 as a member of the Environment Committee in the European Parliament. So a lot of the directives and regulations that are still applying here in the UK were done when I was there. Things like you no know, uh, waste recycling, uh, the uh, waste electronics and electrical appliances directive, the uh, recycling of vehicles uh, and, and and the water framework directive which was a big piece of work that, that i was involved with as well as a lot of issues on for example um uh, vehicle emissions so you know the the rules that volkswagen allegedly broke were rules that were made while i was in the european parliament and um so i, I had a fairly good grounding in that particular area uh, uh when i arrived in in westminster i, I sort of concentrated on, on transport related things. I was on the shadow transport team. I became a transport minister. And of course, following uh, George Eustace's resignation just before Boris became prime minister, I had a six or seven month spell at DEFRA as a minister there in, in the year before um, uh, COVID. So I actually got to go to all those agricultural shows. And when Neil Parrish had to resign from the EFRA Select Committee, I stood and was elected as a chair. And I've got to say, we've got a very good cross-party team. Um, uh, colleagues uh, on, on all sides of the house actually work very well together. Um, first point to make, I think, is that, that we work, try and work very closely with the environment, uh, Environmental Audit Select Committee that Philip Dunn chairs and make sure that we don't sort of overlap too much and end up parking our tax on each other's lawns, so to speak. And uh, we occasionally, I guess, on his committee and he guests on mine. So quite a few of the uh, water pollution related issues have been dealt with by his committee. Um, and we, you know, we work very hard to make sure that we, you know, we're trying to cover every base. Um, we have taken interest in water, particularly recently, you may have seen some of the sessions we've had with Thames Water, who financially, I've got to say, are sailing very close to the wind. Um, a lot of the problems facing Thames a historic when Macquarie um, owned the, the Australian bank, uh, owned a big sl slice of the company, and they were, were you know, were ramping up the debt to sort of 80% gearing, and at the same time paying not only dividends, but quite generous rates of interest to some of their um, investors who are also owners of the company. And and one of the issues we're looking at at the moment is the, the, the difficult job that Offwatch will have moving forward to ensure that... Um, water bills are affordable, but at the same time, the investment that we need to go in, in improving particularly uh, sewage outfalls uh, goes in there, uh, but at the same time, water bills are kept down. And also that the, um, you know, that we don't return to a, a situation where egregious dividends were being paid to some of these water companies. Um, Thames have to refinance a big slice of their capital in April, and we're all looking as other markets to see if they're able to do that. Uh, and whether their institutional investors will be able to continue to support the company. And it's a, I was thinking it's a little bit like this, you know, if you, if you owe the bank a thousand pounds, you've got a problem. If you owe the bank a million pounds, they've got a problem. And I think that's the problem facing the investors in Thames Water. 
And the government have passed a statutory instrument to ensure that if there was a problem, a serious problem, then in the same way that some of the rail franchises have been taken over by the state, that the uh, the state would be the operator of last resort in terms of those water companies. And it's important that now we actually know what's going on with our sewage outfalls. I feel a little bit sad that, that you know, with this, this government, this party that I'm a member of, is being accused with, you know, ramping up sewage spills. Actually, a decade ago, we didn't really know what was going on. And actually, the situation is improving. But now we have more data than, you know, campaign groups in a very good position to draw attention to what's going on. And it's good that we can shine uh, the, the spotlight on that. But I think it's important that we recognise that there's been a lot of investment gone in over the last 20 years since privatisation, since things like the Bathing Water Directive came in. One of the other areas we've done a big report on is soil. And, and soil will have an important part to play in, in not only the, the way we manage uh, water and flood water, uh, but the, the way that we manage carbon. Uh, and, and I think our reporters said basically, you know, we talk a lot about air quality and water quality, but soil is, is the third of those. So um, our report, we're waiting for a, a response from the government looking at how we can improve soil as a carbon storage uh, mechanism and how using the sustainable farming incentive, we can encourage farmers to manage their soil more sustainably. Um, we've been uh, looking at a number of issues, and I think the most important one, and there's debate this evening in Parliament on the future of agriculture, is um, the way that we are changing the way we support agriculture from just basically giving pa farmers a, a cheque every Christmas to actually encourage them through the ELM scheme to um, change the way they farm. And of course, we've got big, I can see it on television across the office, you know, big demonstrations in Brussels when they're trying to do the same thing to switch support from uh, direct support to strings attached support, which will benefit the environment. And I'm sure we haven't got to, to, to the end of that. So um, we're busy doing all these things. We've done things on dangerous dogs, which doesn't necessarily relate to the environment. We had a very good session with the fisheries minister just after Christmas. Uh, looking at fisheries management and how we can now as an independent coastal state move forward, how we can have, you know, not only more marine protected areas, but also at the same time have better opportunities for fishermen. So the committee is very busy indeed. Uh, the members are all very engaged. We've got the one of the best attendance records in the parliament in terms of the committee. And um, I'm proud to, to, to chair it and, and pleased that we are doing work in not only holding the government to account, but also I think sort of encouraging the government to move in a direction that maybe members of the committees would like. So I'll, I'll stop there and, and ask for some questions, if I may. Thank you. That was really interesting um, to get that overview. Um, we've had some questions that have been submitted ahead of time, so I'll start one of those. But if anyone has any questions that they haven't submitted or that come up in response to what Robert has said there, um, please do put them in the chat and then we'll um, come on to them in a minute. Um, first of all, uh, I'll kick off with what might be a good opening question. Um, from Craig Nelson from Tech UK, who I don't think is in the call currently, but if you are here, Craig, please do jump in and ask it. And um, if if not, I'll do this one. Um, how does the Office for Environmental Protection feed into the work of the committee? Um, and also, um, what what do you think the committee can do with the remaining parliamentary time that you have left for an election? Yes, well, I I, I met with uh, Dame Glennis uh, quite recently in December to discuss the office's um, projects and, and their way forward. And, and I, I, I certainly got on very well with her and I think we've got a good working relationship moving forward. And the, the, the secretariat who, you know, let's face it, do all the, the heavy lifting and the research and the work for the members of the committee, many of whom are, you know, we're all MPs with lots of other things going on. Uh, they have regular contact with the secretariat um, to ensure that we can, uh, um, move forward. Uh, and in fact, my clerks attended the meeting, which was the, the title Progress in Improving the Natural Environment in England. Um, moving forward, um, given that we all know there's going to be an election sometime this year, uh, I think we're loath to start a, a big report on something which could then be cut off halfway through because elections being called. I mean, we're all assuming it's going to be on the 14th of November, but who knows what might happen. So I think there'll be a good opportunity once we've finished the big reports we're doing. We're doing one on um, on trade and, and trade liberalisation. And part of that's about environmental standards and whether we should you know, allow imports in from countries that don't have our tough environmental standards. 
but I think we'll be what we'll be seeing is more one-off sessions, evidence sessions. So if any um, members of the APPG um, uh, want to contact me or the clerks uh, and make suggestions, we tend to have a, a sort of session of the committee in private session to decide what, where we're going to go forward. But I think reports that uh, or evidence sessions that maybe one or two sessions rather than the big big reports will be the way forward. So. Uh, I'd be keen to hear any um, suggestions that we could move forward with in that way. And in some ways, it's, it's better because, you know, if, if you have a meeting and at the end of the meeting, we draft a letter and send it to a minister or to Ofwat or someone like that. Actually, that's quick results. You know, we can, we can have within a week, we can have the hearing, get the evidence and then make a submission and, and try and get some answers to some of the questions that might be brought up. And you may recall two years ago, we had the, um, the mass crustacean die off. Uh, off the northeast coast of England, off the coast of Yorkshire, and we had a, you know, we had an evidence session. We suggested the government set up a special committee of experts to look into it. That happened, and within two or three months, we had a a, a document on our desk to look at. So, um, and if we, if the committee hadn't been able to do that, then I don't think we would have got a little bit more of an insight into what the environmental factors were leading to that terrible catastrophic die off of crab and lobster. Uh, which wasn't associated with with dredging in the Tees, as everyone had jumped to conclusion, nor was it associated with the um, algal bloom that occurred at, at, in the autumn that year. Thank you. Uh, it's really good to hear that um, there is you know, still ways that people can feed into the committee, despite there not being loads of time left before an election, and that you've still got you know, strategies for how you can be as effective despite time constraints. Um, we heard from Trudy that unfortunately there's been a bit of a, a, a diary uh, clash um, and so she's not going to be able to make it, but I'm going to carry on with chairing this. However, she has apparently been reading up on your Green Spaces inquiry this morning. Um, so I, if you wanted to, to talk about that at all, I'm sure she'd be thrilled to hear whatever you had to say. Um, however, I will move on to one more of the um, pre-submitted questions. Um, I think Andrew Large, who is here as far as I can tell, um, do you want to ask your question about resources and waste? Yes, thank you very much, Lucy. I'm I'm, I'm grateful for you giving me giving me the floor. Um, yes, Sir Robert, I I represent an organisation called the Confederation of Paper Industries. We're associate members of the APPG, and our members are one of the biggest recyclers in the UK, and we are uh, recyclers of in excess of three million tonnes of paper and paper-based products uh, every year. We've been greatly uh, concerned by the frankly chaotic implementation of the government's resources and waste strategy, uh, in particular the deposit return schemes, uh, the extended producer responsibility and what was called consistency of collections is now called simpler recycling. Um, collectively, in our view, all of those will lead to a worsening of the quality of recovered materials for recycling across the board in the United Kingdom uh, and will do nothing really to increase volumes of recycling either. Uh, and in the light of what you've just said about evidence sessions uh, from your committee, I wondered if I might encourage you to hold an evidence session with DEFRA officials and other witnesses uh, and I, I for one would certainly be happy to, to come to your committee and give evidence if, if you felt that was appropriate um, on the whole issue of the implementation of the resources and waste strategy and the uh, future direction of EPR, DRS and simpler recycling. Thank you. Yes, well we have been very much involved with this along with the environment, Environmental Audit committee and and actually you know paper is part of the solution to the problem you know looking at uh, food packaging uh you know plastic we're trying to phase out plastics as much as possible and in many instances paper is part of the solution of course if, if you have to spray paper with a plastic film to make it waterproof then obviously um that makes that paper very difficult to recycle next time round but um uh, I, I think i mean Having met with with many of the food manufacturers to talk about EPR, um, I think they're concerned that they're paying in this money for the recycling, and then they're relying on local authorities who, in some cases, don't have the capital resource or the expertise or the consistency of approach that maybe taking it out of local authority. Con yes, by all means, let the council collect the waste, but maybe we need some you know bigger. Uh, 
recycling plants that are, that are much more capital intensive, much more sophisticated to enable us to make more of the waste that's coming in uh, as a resource. Um, and I think that's one of the biggest concerns. We're still faced with local authorities who uh, are going to have these um, charges um, taken from the producers and then sort of given to them to do the recycling. And, and you know, basically, you know, I'm very much a, a supporter of, you know, he who pays the piper should play the, should, should, should call the tune. And, and I think that many of the uh, packaging manufacturers feel that maybe we're not moving in the right direction. I think DRS, um, the, I think the issue of that is devolution, to be honest. I mean, Scotland was um, uh, going to go ahead of us. Uh, and I had meetings with a number of the, uh, you know, the people who make a very popular cola drink in this country, uh, say, well, you know, we, we, we're going to have problems because, you know, we're going to have either reverse vending machines or um, retailer take back. Um, and, you know, we can have a different system in Scotland as in England. Therefore, we're going to have different barcodes on the products in Scotland. We're going to have people in Berwick-on-Tweed buying products and trying to recycle them in England. We're going to have people, you know, buying products. Um, or, or indeed, you, you, you get a heat wave in, in Glasgow and you need to send a few truckloads of um, Fanta up there. And all of a sudden, those uh, cans aren't available to be recycled. So, you know, I, I think that we, we need to really make sure if we do move with um, a, a DRS system, which I think it is a good way of, um, I, I mean, we're very good at recycling containers in the home. Uh, what we're not good, good at is recycling containers that people have on the move. They're either discarded or uh, thrown into a, a general waste stream, which makes them in some cases more difficult to extract. So I think we do, we do need a bit of sort of cross uh, government uh, working with Wales, uh, Northern Ireland, less so in Northern Ireland because they've got an integrated market with the EU, but certainly with Scotland to ensure that we move forward together. And if we can improve levels of recovery of particularly drinks containers, and I think that's uh, the, the right way forward. I think also, uh, and, and I think you, you were absolutely right, Andrew, when you talked about, you know, a, a consistency strategy. I think that's much more understandable than, than talking about simply recycling. I mean, different local authorities have different rules, different bins for different things. And I think it makes it difficult for consumers to understand exactly what they should be doing. Um, I mean, at my local authority in North Yorkshire um, collect the uh, landfill waste uh, or one week, and then the next week they collect the recycling, and it's separated into glass and cardboard, etc. Uh, but actually, we don't we don't participate because we go down to the um, uh, local uh, Morrisons, where they actually have separate coloured glass collection, where they have different types of containers and they have aluminium foil, they have batteries. Um, and, and, and I think people who really want to do the right thing um, are not altogether convinced that when they're putting their mixed recycling together, that it's actually going to be recycled properly. A lot of this waste is, is probably a resource not well used. And, you know, what's the point of putting coloured glass in with white glass and then trying to make it into new white glass? I think finally, I, I, and our committee uh, have been looking at plastic recycling. It, it is an absolute crime that, that much of our plastic is exported overseas. It used to go to China. Uh, they brought in tough, tough stands because they didn't really want our rubbish. I think a lot of the waste wasn't being properly recycled in China. Now it has to go to OSCE countries, which are supposed to have higher standards. But our committee uh, expressed grave doubts about places like Turkey, where a lot of the waste goes, as to how effectively that was being recycled. And I think um, looking at how we move forward, I think we have a great opportunity in terms of chemical recycling, you know, break. I mean, if you melt some plastic, you're not going to turn it into the same product in most cases, unless it's very pure uh, into the same product it was made. And it ends up being turned into sort of things like, you know, park benches or, or um, uh, garden furniture or, or like for uh, things that look like sleepers but are actually made of plastic and i think chemical recycling you know breaking down plastics into their monomers and then rebuilding them into plastics i think is is one way forward i think we should uh, push and if we if we don't ban the export of plastics on on a, on a sensible time scale we won't create the incentives here in the united kingdom for people to invest in new technologies like uh, chemical recycling uh, and, and, and enable us to displace the you know, the crude oil feedstock with plastic being turned back into plastic. Um, there was another thing I was going to raise as well on that particular issue. 
which has gone completely out of my mind, but um, uh, no doubt it might come to me later. But there was something else I was going to raise in terms of recycling and plastics. But um, thanks for the question, Andrew. We can go on to a different topic, and if you think of it, <laughs> please do uh, yeah, come over a bit later. Um, there's a question in the chat from Polly Harold from Santander. Um, I don't know if you want to ask that one. Actually, before you start, I've just remembered the other point I was going to make is is how local authorities are assessed on the amount of recycling they do. And I know when I was in a, a meeting of the Environmental Audit Committee, the, the witnesses had, had very sensibly looked at recycling levels in the local authorities where the members of parliament represented. And they were very um, glowing with um, my, my local authority and also, I think, uh, Shropshire, where Philip Dunn was. Uh, but of course, they collect a lot of garden waste. And in my view, you know, garden waste um, should be recycled in the garden where it's produced, not collected by the local authority, transported across the county. Much of it contaminated with soil, which does not really help with composting at all. So I think we need to be a little bit cleverer in the way that we look at how effective recycling is done, because you know, recycling a battery that weighs a few grams is much more important than recycling some grass clippings, which, to be honest, can be left in a heap in the corner of the garden and then spread on the uh, allotment uh, in the spring of the year. So I think just using a crude measure of weight in terms of how effective local authorities are doesn't really give us a clear picture as to how those local authorities are performing. Sorry, uh, back, was it Jeff that was going to ask a question? Uh, Polly, uh, Polly, how yeah. I think is ready to ask that now. Polly and Jeff are easy to confuse. Um, so I just wanted to, I'm conscious of time. Um, so obviously this year we're kind of looking to the government um, supporting TNFD and kind of reporting for financial institutions in the nature space. I was just wondering what you see as the role of kind of private finance in supporting the environmental improvement plan and, and kind of biodiversity more generally. Yes, I think, I mean, it's, it's an interesting question because you know, a, a lot of um, investment organisations, a lot of um, pension funds are so very sensibly latching on to, you know, we're not going to invest in tobacco, which, you know, happened a long time ago. We're not going to in invest in oil and, and all those other things. And, and some of the big corporations are divesting themselves of their coal mines or their, you know, what are perceived as dirty industries. Uh, and, and sadly, that's sort of creating a perverse investment incentive to get high returns investing in some of the things that the big organizations, the big institutions don't want to invest in. Uh, but that aside, I think it is absolutely vital if we're going to get uh, move forward into a cleaner, greener future that we can get finance for those, not, not only the big scale projects like, you know, the offshore wind farms and the, uh, and the, the you know, the chemical recycling, the chemical recycling of plastic plants, but also, I think that small scale um, investments, you know, people being able to get a, a, a good loan, put some solar panels on their roof, people being able to, you know, invest in, in, in their small companies and maybe putting in a, uh, a, um, a, 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 a biogas plant for, for farmers, that sort of thing. So I think it's important that the, that the, the institutions, the banks do... Um, do their best to ensure that where you get a sensible proposal, and it may not have the same rate of return as investing in, you know, some other uh, less green technology, but to ensure that the banks and others help with that. So, and I think also the institutions have a big part to play. And, and I also think it'd be, it's important that, that although I know pension funds and banks and institutions have a global perspective, but, you know, it would be great to see pensions that are invested here in the UK being deployed as investment here in the UK, not necessarily in the Chinese or Far East or American markets. So, um, yes, we do need access to finance and the Green Investment Bank, I think, has a part to play in that as well. Thank you. And um, so, Robert, I don't know how quickly you need to run off, but perhaps we could have really... Yeah, I'm OK for a little while because we were late starting, weren't we? Yeah, yeah that's what I was thinking. Um, Ellie Roxburgh, you had a suggestion for something that perhaps the committee could look at. Um, I wanted if you wanted to sort of ask that question, talk about that a little bit. Yep. Hi. Um, thank you so much for today. Really, really interesting topic so far. Um, I convene a, an alliance of NGOs looking at um, the need for an integrated approach to nitrogen. Um, and we see a really good opportunity uh, for action by government being raising statutory targets in line with the uh, Global Biodiversity Framework commitment. 
and I was wondering whether this is something that you'd be interested in looking in, uh, looking to in in the one off session over the next couple of months. Yes, I mean I think um, agriculture is one of the. I mean I'm a farmer myself, so I plead guilty. You know, one of the culprits in terms of nitrate pollution, phosphates as well, for that matter. And there are some emerging markets. So farmers who reduce their um, pollution can uh, basically sell those credits. And um, uh, one of my worries, it's a bit of a wild west out there. I mean, it's the same with carbon credits. You know, you, you get somebody say, oh, I've got this great scheme. We're going to plant some trees in some remote African country. And some government official in that country is going to sign a piece of paper to say that half a million trees have been planted. And you wonder just how robust those systems are and how what will happen if those trees have been planted succumb to a drought. You know, I mean, we can't even count the olive trees in Sicily in terms of EU funding, never mind, you know, some of these schemes. So I think it's important that we have um, robust and trustworthy schemes. But if we are going to reduce um, some of the um, harmful pollutants in our rivers and, and sea, that cause the eutrophication that that you know then kills other wildlife and causes algal blooms and 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 basically dead rivers and i i was down um in oxfordshire with the uh, environmental audit committee when i was on that looking at the the river windrush and it was it was dead you know it it, it looked like a farrow and bowl paint pot you know one of these nice sort of green colors that you can paint your front door with these days it, it just it didn't look like a river it just looked like a sort of pea soup of of algae uh, and that was all down to mainly in that case i think down to sewage uh, outfalls uh, because even though you know many of them remove the harmful bacteria that there's still a lot of phosphate and potash uh, and nitrates going into water so uh, i think farmers do have a part to play in terms of reducing their reliance on 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 fertilizers but i have to say that you know if if we move to a more sustainable agriculture so more mixed farming more livestock on farms that doesn't necessarily mean that we're going to have less pollution because actually, you know, if, if you're using ammonium nitrate as your major fertilizer, which we do on our farm, you know, you spoon feed that fertilizer onto the crop when it needs it. You can spread it through, you know, a crop of wheat that's that's uh, 18 inches high. You can put on a late nitrogen top dressing. If you're going to start applying slurries and manures, that can only be done when the crop isn't in the ground. And that often means applying it at a time when you could be subjected to heavy, heavy amounts of rainfall and more pollution. So I think, you know, we do need to move forward. One of the ways of doing that is through um, uh, nutrient trading schemes. But I, I, I suspect that, that at some point in the future, there's going to be one or two scandals out there where some of the, you know, the the, the organisations that are selling um, bonds or, or credits are, are going to find actually what they're selling is uh, is not worth the paper it's written on. Uh, um, and that's why maybe we, we need to make sure that we're doing things within the United Kingdom and not maybe, you know, uh, doing stuff globally where we can't guarantee what's going on. Interestingly, we, we were talking about this, this on carbon credits as opposed to nitrates, but um, I was talking to the New Zealand High Commission recently and, and their sheep flock has reduced by about 50 percent because they're planting trees and selling the credits globally for, you know, airlines and other organizations who want to continue emitting carbon. So. You know, agriculture is is going to be squeezed from all directions as, you know, we are selling various um, other things, uh, you know, um, solar panels on agricultural land, wind farms on on, on land, uh, and also some of the um, uh, offsetting schemes that, that mean that we produce less food, either through low input farming or through taking land out of production altogether. Uh, and I think that's a challenge we have to face up to because we, if we aren't producing food here, uh, it's got to come from somewhere. And that could mean, you know, we're planting a tree here in the UK only to have one chopped down somewhere in South America. Thank you. That's um, it's very impressive for your depth of knowledge across all of these different issues. Um, I can see that see the committee and it's very wide breadth has, um, yeah, has helped that. Um, it, I think we've probably uh, at the end of our time now, um, Thank you everyone for attending and for your questions. And thank you, Sir Robert, for joining us and, and answering all of our questions and giving us an overview of the committee's work. Um, apologies to everyone that we didn't have um, Foodie here to chair, um, but I, I, hopefully this has been um, a useful session for everyone. And, and I'm sure that uh, if you're getting in touch with, you can get in touch with the EFRA committee if you've got ideas for one-off suggestions, um, you know, and that they'll be interested to hear from you. Um, so yeah. Well, thank, thank you very much indeed. Us. 
we're on every um, Tuesday afternoon if uh, if people want to tune in. And of course, they sometimes repeat it at two o'clock in the morning on a Sunday or something. But um, and incidentally, I didn't mention Wales and Dolphin. I just saw that message flash up there. I mean, we did a report on on marine cetaceans and uh, and 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 mammals, um, which I think went down very well indeed. Um, looking at, at how we can move forward. And, and interestingly, if we're talking about seals. Um, one of the benefits of leaving the European Union is that we, we signed a trade deal with America on salmon. And one of the um, uh, uh, ways that we could make that forward, move forward is that we had to correspond with American protections, which meant we had to actually protect seals. So actually, funny enough, um, although we, everybody says America is sort of a terrible place for the environment, actually, because we wanted to sign a trade deal with America, we had to extend protections that we have for whales and dolphins um, to uh, to seals, which which was a, a positive outcome of that. So th thanks very much indeed. Thank you. Um, yeah, thanks everyone for joining us. Hope you enjoyed the rest of your afternoon. Thank you. I wasn't planning on enjoying it, but then <laughs> never know. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks.